So good evening to those of you joining us at the Stafford Hamlet Community Meeting. Uh, my name is Katie Wilson. I'm the staff liaison to the Hamlet program. And um, I just wanted to take a moment to welcome you to the meeting and encourage you to find the raise your hand button at the bottom of your screen, most likely. That is how you're going to be able to interact during the meeting, during question and public comment time. So if you have questions or you have a comment, you'll need to use your raise your hand feature and raise your hand and that will let us know that, um, that you have something you'd like to say. So again, welcome to the Stafford Hamlet community meeting. Uh, we are so pleased you could join us and um, I'll turn it over to Bill. Hi folks, thanks. Thanks for showing up. Um, the, uh, the community meeting is gonna consist of basically um, two parts. Um, we're gonna have uh, an introduction for a drawing uh, for a bottle of wine um, with Rick Cook um, leading you through a, uh, a multiple choice question, followed by Mark Brown talking about the Stafford Hamlet um, heritage that, that, um, that we get a little dose of every month. And then our featured speaker um, this evening is the County Sheriff, Angela Brandenburg. So uh, Rick, you wanna get us off the ground with, uh, with our, your brain teaser here and we'll, uh, we'll follow up with, with Mark. Thanks a lot. Certainly, welcome everybody. Well, and Mark's kind of off the hook now because he has actually completed two volumes of the diaries and the history and everything. And when we'll be taking stuff and there'll be some things coming out that way down the road. But Katie, if you could throw up the question, the quiz question for the day. And then there's gonna be a poll that you can take and actually answer the question. And then we'll figure out who might uh, be able to uh, earn a little bottle of wine. So the, oh, Katie, you got the wrong. <laughs> you, there you go. <laughs> so it's Eugene Wine Cellars is uh, sponsoring the Stafford Hamlet Shared Heritage Monthly Quiz. And then you can go to page two, which is, oh, <laughs> You keep giving the answer, Katie. <laughs> so the question is, Oregon's iron dream of becoming the Pittsburgh of the West caused a large migration of workers to the area from A, Pennsylvania, B, West Virginia, C, Ohio, or D, Kentucky. So Katie's gonna give you a little poll thing where, and she can tell you how you can uh, select the answer there. So I'm going to launch the poll and you'll see a prompt on your screen and we encourage you to vote. And after that, we'll give you 30 seconds or so to figure that out if you need a little bit more time. And now that we're high tech here and actually can do mm -hmm. a polling thing. Okay. So Rick, it looks like we have a tie. Okay, what was the what were the uh, answers there? Oh. The uh, we have a tie between Pennsylvania or Ohio. Well, now you can slide that right into the kind of tricked you there with that Pittsburgh of the West piece. But if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide there, mm -hmm. the answer is Ohio. So um, the Names listed below, and Mark will go through some of this stuff for you, but um, from the southeast corner of Ohio was uh, known as the High Rocks area, and uh, a lot of the families came out um, to work for the Iron Furnace out here. So there's just some names that you probably um, have seen in the area and know about, and maybe you have some relatives in there. So with that, Mark Brown, the wizard of... Uh, Pazalia, as I'm calling them, the history-wise. Mark, I'll let you take it away and do the thing that you do. Well, the, the demographic settlement in your community, uh, the first three components were 1840 to 1860, 1860 to 1880, and then 1880 to about 1910. And when you get to the third phase of the third generation, if you will, of settlement, a, a demographic coolness pops up. And it's this rather large migration of uh, people from Ohio um, to your community. 
that uh, uh, Ironton Review uh, piece uh, documented in 1883 uh, the journey that uh, Theodore Royal Worthington uh, went, went from Oswego, uh, he was a collier there, and then went back to uh, uh, Ricks County uh, in Ohio, Scioto County, to recruit workers to come back to Oswego and uh, work the mines. The, um, the mines and, and the furnace. The furnace was in, in Oswego was sort of this up and down thing. It was hot, it was cold, it was hot, it was cold. It, it went bankrupt five different times. But in 1883, when T.R. Worthington went back, they needed a whole lot of people very quickly. So he went back and he captured, um, oh, uh, Dyers and Foxes and Duncans and uh, Smiths and Nagels uh, to come back. There were 40 men that he recruited plus their families. Interesting thing about that though, is that instead of the Northern route that most people took, for some reason, which I don't know the answer to yet, Worthington took all 50 people south to El Paso, and then from El Paso to San Francisco, took a, a ship up to uh, uh, Portland, uh, landed everybody, and then they all came down to uh, basically South Town, a little bit of Old Town. Uh, they went to work in the furnace. Uh, very quickly, it crashed and burned again. Uh, so you had a lot of Ohioans uh, looking for a way to live. So they sort of migrated south to Hazalia and settled in. And that's where you get uh, a, a large portion of your community was from Ohio really quickly. There were 696 uh, residents of the Oswego precinct, which included Hazalia at the time. And by the time, if you go through the 1900 census and call out all of the people from Ohio, there were 68 of them. So a good 10% of all of Oswego uh, was uh, from Ohio, at least uh, uh, 10%. And then if you, if you separate it out to the Hazalia region, uh, at one point it goes up to about 45% of everybody in Hazalia was from uh, Rick's neighborhood in Ohio. So uh, I, I just think that's fascinating. I've, I've done a study a couple of years ago on the Belgian migration to Hazalia. Uh, there were five or six different families, the, the Pollards and the Pulliards and the uh, Doogies and, and so on. And then um, I did a study three years ago, I was in Ireland and um, I was standing at the site of, uh, it was called Angota Moor of a workhouse where uh, a young boy named Michael Rice died. Uh, he was starved to death by the evil British uh, in 1854. And uh, I got so mad at that. I was there for a month doing this cultural tour. I spent all night uh, for the whole tour studying the Irish migration into uh, Oswego at the time. So if you want to know your community really well, one of the things you have to do is to uh, disassemble the cultural backgrounds of the people that got there. So um, the, the, the predication of your culture uh, relies a lot on really hardworking people from Ohio. And uh, T.R. Worthington was a bit of a character. And of course, the Worthingtons are everywhere. You throw a rocket, you're going to hit a Wonker or a Worthington. And uh, it's interesting history. Hey, Mark, just real quick, if you could touch, and not only that, but um, how many families off the top of your head came out on the wagon train and ended up here like Shipley? Um, oh, um, I don't know exactly. Okay, but that was um, another one. And then there was others that took the train on the north route. Yeah. Um, my great grandparents um, came out on a train from Tiffany. Yeah, all, all, all of the, uh, uh, certainly the bakers came out on the train. Uh, but I think the original question, how many settlers in phase one, um, you know, I, I don't exactly know, but I would say at least four in, in 1850 to 1860 that I can think of off the top of my head. Great. Um, does anybody have any questions for Mark, just real quick, if, if you got a, or if you have any relatives that you knew that came out to work for the Iron Company, get that information to us also. Yeah, I think one of the things I would love to do, and it's probably not going to happen, but I, I would love to really deeply analyze not only the uh, uh, influences of Ohio 
uh, but other other places as well. But I need to go back to Ohio and do some research with uh, the history nerds there. But I, I would love to do that. Not only does it connect, it connects, I don't know, probably 30 or 40% of your community uh, come crawls right out of the um, Hanging Rock Iron region uh, in Ohio that had 60 to 70 different furnaces at the time. We had one, Ohio had 70 just in that one area alone in Southern Ohio, but it is really, really great history. Well, thank you, Doctor of Documentation and what you're doing out here has been great for us. Thank you guys, it's good to see you again. Thanks and it looks more. like um, in our attendee list that Richard Wernick is the winner of a bottle of wine. So Richard, Nice to see your name out there, at least. And then um, I'll get in contact with you or send me an email and we'll, get, we'll figure out how to get you your bottle of wine. And once again, thank you, Gene Wine Cellar, for sponsoring our little history lesson for you. I can deliver it for him if you need to. <laughs> I'm not sure I trust you, Len. <laughs> well, welcome aboard, Len. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks, Rick. Good, good job and uh, good, good information to share with everybody. Uh, so uh, our, 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 our next speaker um, is Sheriff Angela Brandenburg, and um, we understand that uh, she's already got her feet wet with uh, the, the, the hamlet at Beaver Creek, um, which uh, we all know is a nice group of folks, but nothing like the Stafford hamlet. So um, Sheriff Brandenburg, if, uh, if you've got some points you'd like to uh, throw across our bow, that'd be great. And uh, I'm sure we've got some folks that have asked questions if there's time at the end. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. I agree. I think you're a much nicer group. Don't tell them though. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna hear about that. Um, I have a PowerPoint that I'd like to go through with you. I'm gonna try and share that. Um, and then have some questions towards the end. Um, uh, I, this is one of my most favorite parts of presenting is getting out and talking with folks. I can't wait until I can do it in person. Uh, but for now, Zoom is gonna have to be what it is. Um, but I'm looking forward to doing more. So hopefully, let me see if I can share this. Um, can you guys all see that okay? Mm -hmm. Awesome, okay, great. I'm gonna move my bar around here just for a moment. All right, so uh, this is one of the most um, uh, best things about presenting to groups is I really wanna share the good work um, of the men and women of the Sheriff's Office. Um, I think that um, we uh, uh, definitely, there's opportunity for us to do more sharing and coming out and meeting with all of you and, and your other sister hamlets and CPOs throughout the county. So that's one of, one of my goals is to come out and do that my command staff, uh, and then our folks that are working in the field so that hopefully you guys can get to know some of the people that are working for you in your areas. So that is one of my goals, but let me go through this. Um, so our, the mission of the Sheriff's Office is to provide public safety services uh, to you, the people in Clackamas County, so you can experience a safe and secure community. Very straightforward. Um, you know, we've demonstrated that, especially in this last year with all that has happened. Um, we, we love to serve you. Um, our heart is in serving, and I think that we do a pretty good job. Um, as we talk about the size of Clackamas County and the breadth of what we uh, cover for police services, um, you know, we need to recognize that uh, Clackamas County is the size of the state of Delaware. Um, and a lot of that is rugged, rural, you know, wilderness. Um, it's urban, it's rural. So we really have a mix uh, in the county. Uh, and I just, this is a great picture to kind of show that. Um, and, you know, our, our population is growing. Um, two major inter interstates in the county, which, uh, you know, pose some challenges for us. Um, you know, in relation to crime uh, and, and not to mention, you know, our population growing and, and all the things that are going along with uh, maintaining the roads, 
uh, and then our miles of roadway, 7,900 miles of roadways. Uh, in Clackamas County, um, you know, one of the gifts that we have are all the waterways uh, in the county, which pose um, as opportunities and uh, as challenges for us. We have a great partnership with the Oregon State Marine Board um, who help provide us with um, funding to, um, to have a, a year round um, marine um, safety program. And then Mount Hood. So Mount Hood, if you didn't know, is the second most climbed mountain in the world. And we get people coming um, you know, from all over the world to climb this mountain. Um, half of it is in Clackamas County and the other half is in Hood River, our sister county, Hood River, who we have a great relationship with. Um, one of the things that a sheriff's office, a sheriff is tasked with by statute is to provide search and rescue services within their respective county. Um, so that is something that we, uh, that me as a sheriff, I'm tasked with. Uh, there, uh, of course, is there's no funding for that. Um, it's one of the mandates, uh, and we uh, we make do with uh, with what we have. Um, so we have partnerships with volunteer search and rescue groups who do great work uh, for us. They're Portland Mountain Rescue, Pacific Northwest Search and Rescue, Mountain Wave. I'm sure I'm forgetting forgetting some. Uh, we also have our Clackamas County CSAR, uh, who are uh, folks that are under the umbrella of the sheriff's office, uh, not necessarily their own nonprofit, but it takes a village uh, to answer the calls for search and rescue. And, um, and we're certainly proud, I'm proud to, to work with our nonprofit partners um, who help us save lives, literally, uh, at uh, no cost to the folks who are lost. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a fantastic uh, program that we have going now. There was a few bumps in the road, which you are probably aware of. Uh, so we have the Sheriff's Office, we have uh, 456 full-time employees, 343, the majority of these are our sworn personnel, which are our deputies uh, and folks. Uh, we have civilian staff who um, uh, do the jobs that um, support the work of the Sheriff's Office. Um, we have, I'm just giving you kind of an overview of the services that we have, and I won't read all of them to you, but primarily a patrol, jail investigations, our civil division, uh, we have community corrections under our umbrella. We have a Safe Place Family Justice Center, which I don't know if you've heard about. I have a slide for that because that's a great uh, program that we have, uh, uh, Marine Patrol. Uh, we have our behavioral health unit, and I don't know if folks know that we we have, and we have for several years, um, worked in partnership with our health, housing, and human services um, folks with the county to have two uh, embedded mental health workers who uh, who work out of our Brooks, out of our sheriff's uh, um, uh, office, and that we respond uh, together or we refer calls to our behavioral health unit folks when folks are in mental health crisis uh, or they're you know, we don't need to have a law enforcement officer showing up in someone's doorstep that we work in partnership with our BHU unit, uh, and it's a great partnership. Uh, we have contract city operations, which you folks probably know, uh, the city of Wilsonville being our, our uh, longest standing contract city. Uh, so we have a police chief. Uh, who is a captain, and then we have a contingent of folks who serve as that as Wilsonville's police department, much much like um, if they had their own police department. Um, Happy Valley is the same, and Estacada uh, has a, a smaller contingent of folks. Uh, and uh, the good good thing for them is that you know everything that we have at the sheriff's office, all these special units come along with the package. And so uh, we work, and we are very proud of our partnerships with Wilsonville, Happy Valley, and Estacada with our uh, police contract services. And I think they're they're happy with us too so far. So we're going to keep it that way. Uh, an overview. I'm just going to give you an overview of our uh, divisions to kind of give you an idea of what work we do. We're primarily using 2019 stats because 2020 was a COVID year, uh, and there the, some of our data is a little bit skewed uh, because we really limited some of our contacts um, out in the public. Uh, and then it was, you know, a lot of folks were hunkered down in their homes. Um, so 2019 stats for our patrol division uh, responded to um, over uh, 81,000 calls for service, uh, almost 20,000 and traffic stops, uh, search and rescue call outs. Like I said, those are mandated by the, the um, state statute for the sheriff to be tasked with. We had 141 search and rescue call outs. Uh, and then our uh, uh, SWAT and then crisis and negotiation team, which is what the CNT stands for, that we had 23 call outs. Um, our patrol division, some of our, this is a, a good slide to show for our community members. It, it kind of shows you the top six crimes that 
uh, typically have pretty much stayed the same over the last several years about what, what is most common um, for folks to, um, to be the victim of. So theft, criminal mischief, um, there's drug charges, stolen vehicle, burglary, criminal trespass. Um, and of course, uh, we're showing you some slides of um, some of that, uh, you know, when we, um, the bottom left is in particular, uh, shows you that we spend a lot of time, especially for identity theft cases, it's, it's, it's a lot of work to try and locate victims and follow up. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's meaningful work, takes a lot of time. One of our hardworking patrol deputies doing some work there. So our calls for service, um, this is uh, 2018 to 2020 calls for service. Uh, and this slide really shows the, the, the black and the gray show what's what we don't have discretion over. Those are our calls for service for our patrol uh, when they're dispatched or when they have to follow up on, on calls. So what we'd like to see, we have that 28.7% in the green. The green are our proactive times where folks can get out and drive in your community, um, be proactive and, um, and uh, um, you know, get out and stop traffic stops or talk to people, uh, get out and talk with business owners, more of the community oriented policing. So we'd like to have that green a little bit, a little bit more for us to get out rather than and answering calls for service, you know, suppressing crime, preventing crime before it happens. And then a, a quick slide to show what it costs to train and, and equip a patrol deputy. We, uh, we invest a lot of time and money into our patrol uh, folks. Uh, first of all, they have to get through our application process. Uh, not very many people make it through their application and our background and our psychological exam. So when people say, you know, how do you, um, you know, how do we get, you um, of folks who are, are here for the right reason and want to serve and, and want to do this job for the right reason. Uh, this is how we screen folks. It's a very rigorous process. And we, you know, it's challenging to recruit um, folks in this env in today's environment. Uh, however, we are uh, uh, an employer that we have lateral police officers from other agencies that are coming to join us. And so we're quite proud of that. Um, we just don't take anyone though. We do a very, very thorough screening to make sure we get the right people. And then when they're here, uh, it's a very rigorous uh, field training and evaluation program uh, that they, they, they must go through and, um, and, and be successful at. So our investigations division, um, these are our detectives who specialize in a wide variety of crimes uh, that uh, typically are um, some pretty heinous crimes um, that we don't uh, leave uh, to our patrol deputies to do. Uh, and these are typically cases where um, folks uh, you know, that we're investigating are receiving prison sentences for because of the crimes that are so bad. Um, we also have forensic investigators and CSI is what you would, um, that we call them. That's what people know them by. Uh, and they are, uh, are non-sworn folks that process scenes and do a lot of the, the hard work to bring um, cases um, with integrity to the DA's office for prosecution. Very important piece of, um, of work for evidence collection. Um, I'll go back to that one. Uh, and we have our computer uh, forensic experts this day and age, you know, things are technology is crazy. We have to keep up with that. It's a challenge in itself. And then criminal reconstruction investigators. These are the folks uh, that will go out on fatal traffic crashes and reconstruct the scenes to find out exactly what happened. So our investigations division, just a snapshot from 2019, uh, investigated 130 new violent crimes against persons. Uh, 53 new property and financial crimes, uh, which are challenging themselves because uh, I don't know if anybody has been the victim of a financial crime. It takes a whole lot of time uh, to collect everything and to investigate things um, correctly, and it takes a, a, a special skill set to do that. Uh, and then 263 new crimes against children. Uh, and those are typically uh, child abuse, child neglect, um, uh, sexual abuse, those types of things uh, of note, which you may have you know, heard uh, in the news, you know, being COVID in 2020, a lot of our, uh, these numbers have dropped for us. A lot of kids are not in school and, um, and a lot of the mandatory reporting comes from, uh, from adults uh, not within the household. So we anticipate once kids are getting back to school that those numbers for us uh, will increase. So we're waiting to see what that 
what that's going to turn out to be. Uh, and then one thing to think about is that uh, when you collect all this evidence, uh, it has to go somewhere. It has to be stored properly. It has to be stored with integrity. Uh, and then some things we never, ever will ever get rid of um, because they've uh, been involved with crimes such as murder uh, and other things and also unsolved cases. So we curate about 75,000 items uh, in our property and evidence facility. It's up in Oregon City on Red Soils Court. They process about 2,000 uh, new items each month. And then what comes in must go out. They also process uh, items that have already uh, gone to court that we don't have to hold on to, um, or we find, um, you know, we find the rightful owners of property and we reunite owners with their property. So, uh, and then uh, a slide here about our interagency um, drug task force. Uh, this task force is, um, is uh, funded through levy funds that have uh, been, um, uh, Voters voted this in in 2006 or so 2007 is when this team began. Um, this team is a high level um, specialized enforcement team that works with our local and federal partners, and they really interrupt uh, drug trafficking organizations. So I know people talk about, hey, you know, we know that um, uh, hard drugs were somewhat decriminalized, um, their uh, their violations now. Um, why do you need a drug team? And so my answer to that is that. Uh, we don't want drugs and drug crime in our communities. And we're targeting those trafficking organizations, those people that are taking advantage of folks who have um, issues with drug addiction. Um, we're seeing right now, and you may have seen in the news, um, a huge fentanyl um, problem uh, with uh, folks uh, lacing pills that they are selling to unsuspecting buyers with fentanyl. Um, when we've had um, many overdoses uh, just in this year from fentanyl. So this is, uh, this is the, the good work of this team. Um, these are some of the stats that they've done since 2016, since the last levy renewal. Um, and uh, they do really, really good work. Um, and I don't see their, their job going away anytime soon with what we have going on. So uh, a Safe Place Family Justice Center, I talked to you a little bit about this in the beginning. Um, uh, this is a, a division of the Sheriff's Office. This is a, I was the director for a Safe Place Family Justice Center as the Lieutenant. It's a Sheriff's led um, center, a law enforcement led center that is the first of its kind in Oregon. Um, we, uh, we opened in 2013 and uh, there is now, uh, Washington County has a Family Justice Center as well, about one of 125, 30 across the United States. And it's a, it's a very uh, great, neat program where it's a, um, public private um, partnership uh, working with nonprofits to serve um, families and um, children impacted by family violence, sexual violence, stalking, um, uh, elder abuse, uh, abuse uh, with people uh, who have disabilities. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, there's culturally specific services, we have advocacy, um, safety planning, counseling, and even though it's a sheriff's led center, uh, all the services by folks that come in are by choice, no one has to report to law enforcement, they don't even have to talk to law enforcement, um, you know, our good work there with our nonprofit partners um, has uh, led to folks feeling safe to feel that they can report. Um, and so it's just a, been a, a fantastic um, partnership. One of the best things about this is that if you've ever had to um, go to the courthouse, uh, you know what a challenge it is to get in and to just navigate it. Can you imagine having um, been the victim of uh, domestic violence and, and having kids in tow and try and navigate the system? So all of these things um, are wrapped around a person coming through the front door. So instead of telling them to go to the courthouse to get a protection order, go down the street to get um, a DHS grant and go here and go here. Everything is wrapped around that person, including filing for a protection order um, and appearing remotely uh, in circuit court, which is one of the best things that, uh, that we have to offer there. Um, and so uh, for those stats, you know, we um, helped folks with 528 protective orders uh, in the year 2019. Uh, and then over 4,600 um, visits for services. It's a fantastic center. Um, and if you're interested in more, hearing more about this, I can have someone come and do a separate presentation. So I just 
Um, if one thing you take out of this is the resources for these folks who are experiencing these types of crimes, um, we would love to, um, to have them come and, and help, help them out there at uh, the Family Justice Center. So our jail and corrections. So our jail um, is an old uh, aging jail. It's built in 1958, 465 jail bed capacity. Uh, we, um, uh, we do what we can with it. Um, we have received full medical accreditations. We're one of a handful of jails in Oregon who has done that. Uh, we have a very innovative uh, treatment for opioid. Uh, it's tough saying that. Opioid uh, withdrawal uh, and it's medication assisted treatment. Uh, and that is uh, on the forefront of, of helping folks come through um, who, uh, you know, we can help while they're in jail, get them to a place where we can hand them off to community partners once they um, go out of the jail. Our goal with jail is, of course, never to see that person again. Uh, and so we have a lot of programs at the jail where we can um, with help folks um, hopefully navigate um, especially with opioid um, uh, issues uh, of, you know, hopefully getting some help. Uh, so one of the uh, cool things about the jail that most folks don't realize pre-COVID is that we um, assisted more people getting their GED uh, at while they were in jail than Clackamas, Clackamas Community College did. Uh, so those programs have to go on hold with COVID because we really do not want COVID in our jail. Uh, but that's uh, some of the type of the programs that we, that we do because we know that folks who get their GED are less likely to, to return um, and receive our services at the jail. Um, some interesting things with the jail is jails is, is not a great place for those who have mental health issues. Um, but unfortunately, um, um, folks that have mental health issues do commit crime. Um, we are seeing lots of folks who have um, mental health issues, uh, conditions in our jail. So in 2020, the last part in the very bottom, about one third uh, of our adults in custody were prescribed with mental health medications. So that number we don't see um, going lower anytime soon. Um, but uh, you know we are doing all that we can while folks are in jail uh, to get them the help that they need. Uh, another interesting stat on this slide is that uh, even though only 10% of folks reported that they had mental health um, uh, needs at intake, we, um, we ended up prescribing almost 26% with mental health medications. So we work with Health Housing Human Services. We have contracts with folks who are uh, in our jails 24-7 uh, to, um, to uh, help uh, identify um, those folks who may need this help uh, and then um, hopefully get them on a path and work with uh, outside folks, um, uh, partnership ag agencies to continue a continuum of care once folks leave the jail. So public safety challenges, I'm almost, I'm almost to the end to our levy slides, but you know, um, I'm not telling you anything new, but we have increasing uh, population, urbanization, traffic congestion, congestions, houselessness, folks who are uh, you know, affected with mental health conditions and drug use and addiction. And you know, we just don't, uh, we in law enforcement just don't know uh, where uh, we are. Um, there's a lack of treatment facilities and places to divert people with mental health conditions. So oftentimes um, you know, we're going back to the same person, we're trying to help that person uh, uh, and then they commit a crime and they end up in jail, which is not a great place for folks. Uh, so there are some um, serious issues, local issues that we need to work out together because this is not a law enforcement issue about how we can get services for folks before they end up uh, having law enforcement contact. Um, so my priorities since I took over, I've been uh, going at this for going into my uh, fifth month here as sheriff. Um, when I came in, I asked our, uh, our treasurer's office to, uh, to do an independent financial condition assessment of the sheriff's office finances. That's uh, almost completed here. It should be completed sometime this month. Um, also on top of that, uh, we've, I've asked for a staffing study to be conducted, a very 
uh, comprehensive staffing study that'll look at everything, our jail and our patrol and our uh, administration, uh, and uh, to take a look and see are we using our resources correctly in the way they should? Are there other ideas out there where we can um, get a better, bigger bang for our buck and how to do business? So um, this is a great time for a refresh for the sheriff's office to ensure that we're using, you know, the trusted resources that we get from you um, wisely. And, uh, and so there may be some changes depending on, on what that uh, comes out and, and says. So we're really looking forward to that to inform us and use data um, to drive our decision making. Uh, and then we also are in the middle of a, uh, implementing a strategic business plan. So we're excited to work with the county. The county brought in uh, a company called Managing Results and it's uh, managing for results. Uh, it's data driven um, of how, you know, what do you want to get out of, um, uh, of a particular program? Uh, what's the using your data to drive? If we add more money or staff here, what will the result be? And so uh, we're in the middle of implementing that uh, and collecting data to start informing us. It's a really new way of doing business for law enforcement, but uh, I think it's going to be a, a, a fantastic way to really drive where we need to put our resources. Uh, and then as I took over as sheriff, uh, at the end of this year, the public safety local option levy that has been around since 2007, uh, and it's been renewed to, uh, twice since then, uh, is coming to, to the end. And so as, uh, as my team uh, looked at this levy, uh, we projected out the proceeds from this levy, and we know that, that we would not have uh, enough money to run the end of this levy because it's never been renewed for any more money. So it's been the same since 2007 uh, that we would be, by the time we would finish out with a straight renewal, we would be $2 million short, which is about 12 positions. So we did some polling um, of, our, of our citizens to ask, uh, do you want a straight renewal, which would be a, a reduction in, uh, in services? Uh, a slight increase, a moderate increase. And this is how we ended up with um, a 12 cent proposal for voters to decide next week uh, if they would like to continue this levy, continue the same services that you've had since 2000, basically in seven, 2007. Uh, and then uh, with the addition of adding, and I'll show you a slide here in just a, a minute, um, uh, of these proposed added um, positions of programs. So the current levy, so you currently pay for this now, uh, and it is 24.8 cents assessed per uh, thousand assessed, um, or $66 uh, a year. So the median assessed home, the current median assessed home, according to the assessor's office is 267,000. And it currently pays for it and it has paid for uh, 84 jail beds in the jail, reducing the numbers of uh, forced releases by about 50% in the community. Uh, and it pays for 30 sheriff's jail deputies to have those beds, uh, 18 sheriff's patrol deputies, and then uh, the sheriff's uh, specialized drug enforcement team, which I showed you the slide of, of the work that they do. So that's currently what folks are asking this to continue, so to continue paying the $66 uh, a year. Um, and um, the new proposed levy would be an increase of 12 cents. And that would bring you to about $98.26 a year. So from 66 to 98. And that's, of course, that assessed value of 267,000. So this would continue what we've, what we've had since uh, the, the original levy um, has uh, been passed. Uh, it will um, allow us to, I'm gonna move my, position around here. Um, it will allow us to open up 26 mental health uh, medical jail beds by funding six additional um, sheriff's jail deputies. We have beds. These beds sit empty. We've been trying to um, work to get those open. Uh, it's, it's a funding challenge. Uh, it's certainly needed um, for us. And then we would um, add 16 sheriff's patrol deputies. So retain the 18 deputies that are currently being funded, add 16 uh, additional uh, patrol deputies. Uh, it would add five detectives uh, to investigate basically persons, uh, persons felony crimes, uh, elder neglect, child abuse, child neglect cases, human trafficking, 
um, those felony crimes against persons. Also, one of my major priorities as sheriff is to implement uh, and maintain a body worn camera program. Uh, and the funds from the levy would, would fund this portion of our levy um, or our levy positions. And then we would have funding, separate funding for our, our other positions that are not levy funded. So this would, this would um, allow us to have cameras for all the levy funded positions um, of, our, of our patrol personnel. So the 18 um, and plus the 16 patrol deputies. And then we have two internal affairs investigators. We currently, um, we currently have internal affairs investigators. Uh, unfortunately, they're represented uh, members of, of our agency, of our union. Uh, and so it's a very difficult position to put folks into. They're detectives. So they're trained in, in detective work and they, and, they, and they pull a stent in our, where we investigate complaints against our folks. Uh, they do great work. I just think it's a bad place to put them. I uh, would like to return those two detectives back to the detective ranks and add to um, non-sworn so they would not be law enforcement officers uh, that would report directly to me as investigators, um, impartial investigators, investigating complaints. So that, um, that is the positions that, um, and the programs that we would like to be funded with this additional 12 cent increase. Um, and it's a five-year levy, uh, just like the, the last uh, previous cycles of the levy. And, uh, you know, the, it, wouldn't, uh, it would not uh, reoccur without voter approval. And then the monies used would have to be exclusively used for what we've proposed here. So we can't uh, take this and use it for funding for something else. So that's why we specifically um, uh, are telling you exactly what we're going to fund, because you deserve to know what your monies would be going for. So. I am getting to the end. I'm sorry for, hopefully this has been informative for you and is enjoyable for you as it is for me. And let me stop sharing here. Okay, I know I gave you a lot of information in a little bit of time. So be happy to answer questions of folks. Oh, what? Let's start. We've got a uh, one of our new board members has um, started. Uh, I think it's uh, is it Deputy McCord, uh Sarah, that I think he talks with uh, at least once a month. Uh, Andy Munson, are you there, bud? Yep, I'm here. Well, uh, you were going to um, throw some questions to get get the questions um, going uh, to the, to Sheriff Brandenburg. Do you want to uh, you want to start this off? Sure. Hi, my name's Andy. Hi, Andy. I've been out in the hamlet here since I was five. Um, I remember Damon Coates teaching the D.A.R.E. program um, back when I went to Stafford. Um, we've seen a lot of changes over the years out here. Um, fortunately, not a ton of crime. Um, but my primary question is how you guys allocate deputies out here in the hamlet um, we don't see a ton of them out here. And, uh, I went for a ride along in Wallowa County. And when I was with the deputy there, when we went into, uh, into the city of Joseph, he had a contract. So he would document, Hey, we're here from this time to this time, um, to make sure they were getting, you know, what they were paying for. Um, and I think, especially with a levy coming up, it's like, Hey, you know, I, I think it's wonderful that Clackamas County is getting help. Uh, but it's also like, Hey, how much is the Hamlet uh, seeing out of all that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question. And, and really, that, that's one of the questions that I have and, and why the staffing study for me is so important, because it's going to take and crunch the data, the calls for service and, and where folks are spending their time. Um, and so, you know, you're the, the Stafford side of, of the county. Um, like you said, it's not as 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 crime ridden as other parts of our county. Right. And of course, we're going to have staffing where that crime is. And that's unfortunately, you know, how how business is being done. And so um, I wish I had more cops to disperse more around to do that more in the green, right? More in the green of that slide that I showed you, uh, because that's where you start seeing people, deputies driving around, not necessarily going to a call, not responding to you know, crimes in progress, but being present and visible in your community. And so I'm hoping by the staffing study will show us, can we do our staffing differently so you can see those deputies 
you know, out in your area more? Um, does that mean we go to different shifts or get rid of a shift um, or change our, our hours? So there's a lot of, of things that I'm looking forward to for that staffing study that will help inform us um, how we allocate those deputies. Um, certainly, if this levy does pass, you you and your area will see an increase in deputies um, because we'll be sending out four more deputies per shift um, and five if we get rid of a shift because we have four shifts. So those are the things that we're looking at. Um, but I mean, it's a it's it's a really good question, and uh, I think the data, you know, using data, um, they'll be crunching the numbers of our calls for service. Um, and where we've been responding to and where we haven't been responding to, right, quite free, quite uh, um, honestly. And do we, can we put more resources even in those areas where it's quieter, right? Because you're paying the taxes to have the law enforcement in your area. Some of you are paying more because you're paying the enhanced law enforcement district. And I, and I hear you and that's, that's something that I'm, that I really um, want those questions answered in our staffing study. Awesome. Well, Leonard? Well, yes, I've got a couple of questions. One is as far as your uh, response time, since we are such a large county, and uh, do you have stations where the uh, deputies uh, kind of station out of, like the fire department has stations around so they can respond quicker to a call? you have those we do um, yes so we have we have fire stations um sometimes um uh, we have what are called um, rest stops so we have churches who have opened up um basically offices and bathrooms for our deputies because you know you could get a call from here up to the mountain and <laughs> you, you know it's you can't always stop in the middle of the night to use the restroom somewhere so we have quite a few different stations that we do um, have rest stops at and then the, and the, sorry, and then the fire department will they'll let us in their they'll let us in their fire station sometimes. Okay, another question I have as far as how the uh, current unrest in the Portland area is overflowing, as far as how we, you have to respond to that, or have you seen a response re required by by that? So, are you saying into our county or going into Multnomah County? Primarily into our county, but uh, yeah, either way. Yeah, so we are seeing some increased crime from the policy decisions from Portland. Um, and, uh, you know, for us, uh, we work closely with our district attorney's office um, to hold people accountable. And I think it's, it's the expectation, um, uh, you know, that we have in our county and, and, our, our, and you who pay us and, and um, you, you pay us to keep you safe and to uh, prosecute people who do bad things. And so that sends a strong message. And I think that the accountability piece and always, um, and always pushing forward charges to the DA when it's appropriate uh, will, this sends the message, right? That, that this is, when you come into Clackamas County, um, our citizens expect um, that folks will be held accountable. And we do that. And the DA, I know because I work closely with DA Wentworth, and I don't know if you've had him on, he's a pleasure to work with. He also has that same view. Okay, thank you. Any other hands up, uh, Katie? Jane. I just want to say, Sheriff Brandenburg, how I applaud your um, commitment to serving families and, and what you talked about, your wraparound services. I live in this county and work in another as a teacher and have experienced frustrations and, and working with um, these services where families are directed here and then here and then here and then here. And the people that are being harmed most are the children, the, the, the students that I care most about. And uh, so I applaud your focus on this family center that, that you have worked so hard to build, but you are continuing to build. Um, thank you for that. 
Thank you, Jane. I appreciate that. And um, that, that is a jewel of our county. And we should be proud that Clackamas County, you know, the Board of County Commissioners supported that, the, the, the DA's office, the Sheriff's office at the time. Um, and it really is a collaborative effort. And with Clackamas Women's Services, um, with uh, our other nonprofits. So it, uh, it is a jewel. And um, we really need to get the word out about, about the good that we do there. Because um, like you said, this is how we end domestic violence. It's through the children who are affected. Right, one to 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 help with the trauma and not have history repeat itself. And so we also um, so through the a safe place we have um, what's called Camp Hope. And so um, there's volunteer opportunities with Camp Hope as well. If you Google up Camp Hope Oregon, you'll see that we have it's uh, we send our kids to camp um, who are um, who are uh, you know. Uh, patroning uh, a safe place family justice center uh, and it's free of charge these kids probably can never afford to go to camp it's trauma informed there's therapists that are there um, it's just fantastic um, uh, just a way of getting kids out to be kids and around, around kids who have been affected by the same issues and it's just amazing to see um, the difference in the kids that make so uh, there's a there's a plug for um, for camp hope uh, or again, if you guys are interested in, in any volunteer opportunities. Okay. Uh, it looks like uh, we have one more question. Bill, you have your hand up. Did you know that? Yeah, I did know that. Okay. And so Rich is the other one. Am I on then or is Bill? Go ahead, Rich. Great. Thank you, Sheriff. Congratulations on your election. A uh, couple of fun things. So one, you have my vote for the levy. So you got one on that side for the tally. Um, in the Stafford Hamlet, we actually have an annual event, which has been non-annual because of last year and this year with COVID. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's called the Stafford Hamlet Family Fest. Oh. And it would be a wonderful thing. Uh, we have it usually in September. Uh, last time we held it, we had about 700 people from not just the Hamlet area, but Westland, like us, we go 12th and even out of Portland, people coming out to enjoy uh, themselves and, and see what the Hamlet's like. And we would love an opportunity to uh, talk to you at a later date when we have a date in the future to uh, maybe have a deputy. I know you only have so many deputies that you can spread so thin, but uh, a walk around would be nice. We get TBFR here and the, the families love that. So that's, that's a, a shout out for help in the future. And probably the one issue that uh, you haven't heard from anybody is, is a call for help, which would be based on the traffic situation that we have. I live particularly right on Johnson Road, just south of Stafford Road. And we have a very nice one half mile straight stretch. And Jane, who spoke to you a moment ago, can attest to this. We're having drag racing out here in the evening. It's not like there's 15 cars or anything, but there are cars and there's drag racing. And today I had a little white uh, Ferrari go up the road. And having lived here my, my whole life, I would judge at least 80 miles an hour. And so occasionally, and it's been a while, by the way, and this is a reminder to you and, and a please, uh, we've had very great success of having uh, motorcycle sheriffs here and patrolling the area and um, anything you could do to point people our way is uh, most appreciated. Come park in my driveway. Come park <laughs> exactly. because they put on a great show. Yeah and uh, you'll see the burn marks on the road. They're doing and I know this this happens everywhere but where we're located we also hear all the traffic racing in the middle of the night along Borland Road as well from uh, Wonkers Corners clear into Westland. So uh, just a little shout out, let you know what's going on and uh, any help you can send our way would be uh, much appreciated and the best of luck uh, for the levy and your time as sheriff and I hope that uh, it's a long time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And we would love to come to your events. Uh, not only do I have deputies, but I have command staff folks that are salary. So we'd love to send um, and, and they, uh, you know, that is, that is one of my goals is to get out and to meet with all of you and hear from you your concerns. I do know about your traffic problems. Um, I don't know if any of you were, was it last, you know, was it last year that we had the sheriff out 
to talk with uh, the, uh, the Department of Trent two years ago, right? So I was there for that. Maybe we met there, Richard. Um, so, you know, we do know that you are, you, there are a lot of traffic issues in your area. So we hear you. And uh, so we will, and yeah, I, I, we hear you. It, it's, it's sometimes like shooting fish in a barrel out there, so. All right, Bill, you're up. Okay, so we're gonna segue back to the Family Justice Center, which um, what a positive, uh, a positive approach. Um, does it replace, and, and again, I'm not up to speed. I, I was involved um, voluntarily for a while with the Clackamas Women's Shelter. Is, is, is that take the place of the Women's Shelter or are, are both in place and one's and funded separately? Yeah, that's a good question, Bill. No, we work uh, hand in hand uh, with Clackamas Women's Services. So they've been our longest, Clackamas County's longest domestic and sexual violence um, service provider in the county. And they have a uh, women's shelter um, and they provide a ton of services for the county um, and they do great work. But we, they actually, their entire staff uh, is in the Family Justice Center and they work with us out of, uh, out of a safe place. Uh, mm -hmm. and, yep. And so uh, they're, they're one of our biggest uh, uh, nonprofits that we work with. Uh, so it's a great partnership. And uh, we, I, 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 the Melissa Earlbaum, who's the executive director and I are very, very close. Um, and out of that partnership with law enforcement um, and with domestic violence and sexual assault providers is becomes trust. Which, which in turn transfers over to the folks they're working with who may be distrustful uh, about reporting to law enforcement. So when advocates have been working with detectives and deputies and we're all in it together, we live together there at a safe place. Um, it's a unique uh, bond and that translates to the folks that we're serving to give them um, sometimes what they need uh, to come forward and to tell their story and to know that um, special prosecutors who are trained in domestic violence and sexual violence will, will, uh, will help them um, and through the process, which is tough. So it's, uh, it's just one of the, just like I said, one of the jewels of, of Clackamas County. Well, that, that's, I mean, not only is, is that great, but the, the focus that you brought up a number of times this evening about getting your, uh, getting your folks into situations where they're not responding to a crisis, but they're um, building relationships. I, I got to believe, um, I got to believe that, that not only is that good for the community, but it's also it's also um, got to be a morale builder for the uh, for the officers, for the field folks. And uh, I mean, that's yeah, I, I'm sure that, you know, that just as you described how hard it is to get um, to get new folks in in the door that are going to um, be able to attend the academy, you know, after you do all your your vetting. Um, it, it's yeah. So, anyway, yeah, right then. Thank, thanks for sharing all this with us. Um, Katie, is there, is there one more question before we, uh, we sign off? No, that's it. No more hands. Sure. You, guys weren't, you guys weren't too tough on me tonight. <laughs> well, we'll hope that, uh, that, that silence means that, that, uh, that you get your levy passed and uh, that all the things that come with that um, can go into place. So um, th thanks so much for your time. I appreciate that very much. And look forward to coming back and meeting with all of you in person uh, at some point uh, and uh, getting to know you more. And yeah, thanks for your support. Thanks for the time tonight. I really appreciate it. You bet. Thanks, thanks so for much. coming. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Um, so I, I think folks that um, that, that um, that's the end of the community uh, meeting portion. We're going to move into the CPO meeting, and I see that uh, the, the entire CPO board um, is in attendance. So, uh, Randy, if you want to uh, if you want to boot up and, and run with the CPO meeting, that would be great. You've got some good stuff on your agenda for tonight. Okay. Um, maybe someone, uh, one of the other members could speak to the conditional use request uh, on Homesteader. Um, I think that's out of our uh, area. 
and also the chiropractic uh, uh, and massage clinic on Wisteria. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. And uh, then Mitch could give us a uh, rundown of the, uh, uh, of the uh, soccer facility uh, in his neighborhood and the CPO summit. And then uh, uh, the school project update. I don't know anything about the school project yet. So uh, Land, Land should probably give us a update on that. And then I'll follow with a uh, uh, description of what's happening out at uh, Rossick Field, which is the uh, northeast corner of the Rosemont traffic circle. So maybe uh, Len or Mitch could, could chime in on the, um, on the uh, Homesteader Lane situation and the Wisteria situation. Len, you, you have to unmute. I put my button, but I didn't want to do it. Okay. Yeah. Back now. Uh, one thing we've had a problem with is getting information from the county because of our current post office box problem. Uh, I just today got a uh, notice of the Wisteria application. I haven't even gone through it yet because I just, just got it from my mail. But uh, We'll try to get this uh, mailing resolved so we get more current information uh, quickly, like we did before. So that's hey, 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 Len. Yes. This is Mitch. I, I can speak to the Wisteria thing. I've looked at it pretty closely. Um, the homesteader, I'm not that familiar with, um, but I, the, the, the Wisteria one, I, I can at least give an update. And people can decide for themselves what they think. Whenever, whenever. I, I'll, put, I'll go on mute so you're done. Go ahead. Okay, as far as the, uh, that's, that's all I have, because like I say, we haven't been getting any uh, current uh, application data. And I'll talk to Randy about uh, getting that taken care of later. Okay. Randy, do you want me to go ahead to talk to the chiropractic facility proposed on Wisteria? Uh, yes, take uh, it okay. on. Okay, fine. So um, I, I did study this in, in some detail, um, and, and basically, there's a section 822 in the, in the, the ZDO that allows for home businesses, or they call it home occupations. Um, and, and this um, is a 5.7 acre property on Wisteria. It's actually in the Hamlet. Um, of course, it's in the CPO too. But, um, and, and basically, um, the, the owner of the property wants to, there's, there's, a, there's two homes on the property. One is literally covered with ivy um, and it's, it's, it's probably the original home on that property, I would assume. And then there's a driveway that's it's a decaying driveway kind of going down the side of a hill onto Wisteria. It's a separate driveway from the driveway on the primary home and that the driveway for the primary, primary home also serves a couple other homes right adjacent to the property. Um, and, and what they want to do basically um, is to, to take the old um, rundown home, redo the driveway back onto Wisteria, and then create the old home with the new building basically um, for a chiropractic center. Maybe it'll be a yoga classes. Um, and, and in general speaking, I, you know, home occupations are, are allowed per 822. Um, so that, that's just what the situation is. I mean, you, you can, in this case, you can argue that there's a maximum of five cars available um, or, or to be on, on the site at any one time. And they're gonna have three or four employees um, and three rooms. So they're gonna have a hard time meeting that five car requirement. You know, I'm not saying that's a, is a major issue. I'm sure they potentially could get exceptions for that. Um, and, and they're making, and they're having, proposing that the facility be a, you know, one floor 1500 square foot office, which is complying with A22, as far as I can see. Um, so really, it, you know, to me, it, it comes down to whether the people who actually live next door around the area consider it to be unacceptable, because there are things in, in the code that say they can't, um, they, they, they can't um, change the, the environment or, or change the look of the area, 
or impact things like that. Um, so, um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't really have a real strong position one way or the other personally. Um, if I were live next door, I, I might. Um, and I, I assume those people know what's going on on, on Wisteria. Um, I, they say they notify within 500 feet, which is probably about three properties around them, maybe four. Because you know, in five acres, you don't you don't get many pro properties notified. Um, and then, of course, the CPOs. I, I I got put onto the CPO email list. And that's I guess that's how I got it. And that's why we're you know, at least that's, that's a good thing we can, we can find out about it. So that that's kind of what, um, you know. And the person who lives there is is a chiropractor, and she wants. And of course, you know, I, I can understand why she might want to have her business on a, on a property like that. So you know, to me, I'm not going to take a position one way or the other. It's in the Hamlet. I'm not people in the sure if people in the Hamlet would have a position, um, or the people who live nearby assume they've been notified. But that's that's the situation. And if you have any comments, they have to be submitted by the 17th, I think, of May. Um, and then they'll make a decision, and then they, the county make a decision. The, the planning people really now, and then somebody, if they don't agree with it, would have to appeal to the a hearing officer with associated two hundred fifty dollar fine or so um to 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 oppose it if 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 the planning person would approve it um or vice versa if she does, doesn't approve it then i suppose the chiropractor could also appeal to the hearing officer so anyway you know i don't know if you guys are familiar with the property or not um i'm i drove by it um it's you know uh, wisteria is kind of out of the way you have to have to really want to go to wisteria to, to drive down wisteria but that's a nice a nice drive though <laughs> so I'm, d I'm done for now if anybody has questions or whatever. Patty? Uh, what is the, yeah, I have a question. Uh, what I would like to know what the address is um, because I do live in that neighborhood. I don't live on Wisteria, but I live in that neighborhood. Um, it's two five, I think, uh, Len, do you have it in front of you? I can look it up, but uh, it's two. So, so the address is 21510 South Wisteria Road. Okay, and then my other question is, um, you said that there is a provision in the codes or whatever for a home mm -hmm. occupation business. Correct. This sounds like they're not going to be in the home. They're going to be in, the, they're building a new facility. Or right. That was, the, that was the old home that was totally unlivable. And so they're going to take that and build a facility. Right, that's right, Patty. And I and I and I had the same thoughts as you initially, and I studied it really closely. Um, I mean, I, I can put that on. I can share that on my screen if you want, Len. But um, I think I have it. So, one, let me, Len. One, let me. I can share that, that same exact picture on my screen. So, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. If I can figure out how to do that here. Hang on. Well, and this is Tate. I, I can jump in here. I'm I'm uniquely uh, affected by this because it's actually my my direct neighbor, ah, uh, Shiloh. Okay. And so she's she's currently the proprietor up at Cascade um, Summit up up top. And then so she's starting off her own her own uh, shop down below. And it's it's right across my driveway, which we all share. And we're we're big proponents of it. Um, <laughs> Uh, she's her and her family. Her her husband's actually the vice principal up at Rosemont Ridge. Um, they're they're great people. I, I think they're planning to be very tasteful with it. So, you know, as as one of the people within the you know few hundred feet that that it does affect, and actually we our view will look right down on it. I'm I'm kind of enthusiastic about it. I if there was anybody out here to to do it, they'd pull it off. It's the same. It's the same uh, piece of property that has the the little like three acre vineyard on it. Patty, I'm sure you've seen it when you, when you walk by. Okay. Yeah, sure. So, so um, the, how many houses are there on that driveway? Are there three houses, Tate? There's four. Wow. There's four. It, was, it was originally a 20 acre parcel and it was split into four or five acre parcels. Okay. Is she the furthest one up? Yes. Yeah. She's the farthest one away from the road. The, the vineyard's right in front of her house. I'm actually looking at the house right now. My Wi Fi is down in my house, so I'm up at the shop right now. Okay. And There's a house. The clinic is down right down here. The house is up here. So there's a there's an existing, um, totally probably rundown house right on the property, and they want to build something there. Is that right? Yeah. 
I think it was the original home for the 20 acre parcel that was here. I've, yeah. I've been in it personally. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's going to need ground up, you know, help. I, I don't know if there's too many studs that aren't, that aren't rotten in that thing. Um, so I'm curious, Tate, why are, why are you a proponent? Are you not concerned about the traffic? Oh, I don't. I, I mean, I, I can't imagine her taking more than six or seven clients a day uh, down there. She only works two or three days a week as it is. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I don't know. We're just we're just, a, <laughs> we're just big fans of the family. So okay. uh, she's, she's going to hire a couple more people, though, Tate. I mean, you know that, right? I mean, yeah, to this. no. And we and, and we and we've chatted about it. Um, and and I just I you know, the the way that they they keep their their property up and, and how good a neighbors they are. We just, we just can't imagine it ever being a, a negative. Honestly, we just, we want to keep them up there. Um, they're, they're the type of people that we want living in the Hamlet. Yeah. I mean, and you are, you know, just like what Mitch said, it's the neighbor, the immediate neighbors who are the ones who should be most concerned about you know, all of us. So do you, does everybody share, do the other two households up there share your opinion? You know, we haven't discussed it too much. I guess there's probably maybe one other house that that's, that's that would be directly affected that they they probably be right there. And and I just, we haven't had that conversation yet. But um, I, mean, I guess I I could uh, uh, broach it with them. But yeah, I don't I, I don't have any immediate objections personally. Okay. Well, interesting. Thank you. No, I don't I don't I don't like I said I don't have a position on myself. You guys, you definitely Tate would have the a better view of the situation, but I, I will comment on Patty. Um, they are, even though it's a separate home, they are allowed to have a separate building as the home. They call it a home occupation. It's, really just a, it's a business on their properties, what it really is. Okay. They are allowed to have a 1500 square foot structure for the business on their property, subject to, you know, how many cars they have and, and, and some other things. And, and, and I don't really see other than maybe a few cars too many, not a big deal. I don't think personally, um, I don't see how it's a big violation. So that's why I don't really have a position. And, and I think I think the, the neighbors are the ones who, who you know, who would, would have the most to say about it. And, right. Yeah. Uh, I'm just I'm just I'm just saying telling what's happening and, and I'm not taking a position personally. Well, and I just think in the grand view, this this type of home business is is what we want to secure in the area. It's 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 really not much different than than Fiala Farms out there. This, we want people anchored here that are going to fight for you know, keeping the zoning the way that it is because she doesn't want to have to tear this down, you know, and in, in five years and such. And I think they could be a, a powerful proponent. We have a question in the audience, uh, Laura. Hi, yes, I hope you don't mind. I just wanted to chime in. Um, I'm not a direct neighbor with this family, but um, we are neighbors. Uh, we're on the street bar circle. And um, I've known this family for years because we have kids the same age. And they, when they moved into this property, they completely updated it and fixed it up. It was pretty run down and they've done an amazing job. And I have no, I, no doubt at, um, at all that they're gonna do a really good job with this business. And the way the driveway is, it's kind of hidden from Wisteria. So I would not foresee it being any type of a, a problem with the aesthetics of the neighborhood. So just wanted to chime in and vouch for this family as a neighbor as well, but not a direct neighbor. Okay. Yeah. I, don't have, I, don't have, I don't have anything else personally. It's just, I just was bringing it forward as all. So it's a bit show. John McCabe has his hand raised. Yeah, my cool question is, uh, when these places go in right now, it's certain level and someday they may sell it. And I guess what I look at is, is there anything in the code, like they're saying, I think I saw that they expect, and I might not see it incorrect, that they look at the maximum number of cars going in and out would be 20 when they hold the yoga classes. And my question is, if it becomes more than 20, where's the enforcement? And that's what I'm looking down the line is the next owner could, it, it, it sets a standard where if they get in and they say 20 and then somebody else wants to start a place and they do 20, pretty soon we, we, we become commercial in the Hamlet. Uh, 
Does it automatically, does it automatically um, go to, if somebody buys it, do they automatically get um, that exemption with it? Not sure we know. Not sure we know about that. Rich. I don't know about that. Yeah, when you have a conditional use uh, permit that's uh, home occupation, it is transferable on the property. So the next person in line can assume that uh, that uh, conditional use. Um, no, they can. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely the way they do it. It moves with the ownership. Um, and there is not a time out for this. I know that there are like Marion County who actually um, reviews things on a yearly basis. So to John's point about who actually has it in the future, if that's the case, and if they were to continue it, uh, what has to happen is has to be the neighbors or anybody can complain about it. Uh, but the county then will take, usually it takes two people to take action on a complaint status. So if they were to go completely out of compliance today, even though they're a great neighbor, um, but if they did that, it's up to the public to then uh, object to the way they are performing under the conditions of their conditional use. All conditional use applications are renewed periodically anyway, so they will have a renewal date and established no matter what the occupation is. Well, uh, Randy um, and, and anybody else on the CPO uh, board, uh, do, do you guys, I mean, do we want to take a vote on this? I mean, it, it to me, what Tate's describing is exactly what you want in the context of of folks being supportive of I mean the things floated to the surface and they're being up front they're following the rules of the road they're not trying to slide anything under the radar um, I, I mean I don't know if this if this is is beneficial to them or if there's you know if it's enough of a, of a standard application that you know us giving our opinion on um, you know, certainly a, a positive opinion, if that's what it was, um, would would uh, would not necessarily, you know, um, impact it. I, I just didn't it, it, to have to have people follow the rules and and play the game fair and put themselves out there um, and be, you know, forthright about what they're going to do. And for Lynn's, you know, comment that there is, you know, a review process, although I will say Clackamas County doesn't exactly, uh, impress me with how they, um, you know, how their enforcement arm, um, works. Uh, it, 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 it seems like, um, it seems like, you know, a very positive, um, positive, non-impactful, you know, with the exception of traffic, um, uh, business that they're trying to put together. So, uh, do we do we want to take a vote, get CPO vote? I just say we can do uh, one of three things. Uh, if either no comment, uh, we can uh, pass a resolution uh, for it, or pass a resolution against it. So we can do any one of three things, whatever the group decides. No. Well, you got three choices. Why don't you Why don't you take a vote on the three choices? Uh, you see it. You see it differently. Any of you guys? I mean, you've, you've got uh, you know you've got something something in the neighborhood of fourteen or fifteen. Um, besides the, the staff, our our the, the staff and our our uh, our two boards um, here voting. So, um, do, do you want to take a vote? So, Rich. Uh, you know, I just want to interject very quickly. I think the standard for the CPO should be whenever one comes across a desk, we create an opinion. The three that Len listed, you know, no opinion yet in favor or against. I think that would be the standard that I would suggest uh, for the CPO board to adopt. And the only thing I'm going to add to that is 
uh, I think it's still in the CPO bylaws that you have to come to a meeting before you can vote. It isn't that way in the Hamlet, but it is, I think, still in the CPO. So no, we yeah. amended that bill. I all Everybody anybody can, can vote. vote. Okay, field goal. Take that off the. Take that off. That I didn't. I didn't say that. Kate Roth, that strike that from the record. Um, anyway, go ahead, guys. Uh, Randy, you want to you want to throw a vote out there for your folks? Um, I'm not too sure exactly uh, what kind of vote we should uh, we should uh, have, but uh, those in favor of uh, just remaining neutral, not saying anything, raise your hands. So we'll ask attendees to use the raise your hand feature to do this also. Okay. And uh, those against and... So, hold on just a minute. It takes a little bit longer, Randy, for everyone to do the raise your hand feature. So we had okay. one vote for a neutral. Yes. Okay, and what? I, okay. And Mitch, are you voting for neutral? Just right. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I have no real position. Right. It's okay. So let's just pause. If everyone who wants to stay neutral, please use the raise your hand feature. Right. I one. Okay. We're just going to pause and give everyone a sec to do that. Okay. So we have five votes for a neutral stance. And. Oh, that's a good. I don't see the. Those, but if you can see them, that's good. Yep, um, and so let's let's move on to uh, those who are opposed to the um, those who are opposed to the the application. Could you use the raise your hand? It looks like we have one vote opposed. Uh, and those who are in favor of the application. That would be me. We have nine votes in favor of the application. Katie, how, how are you counting those? I can see all the panelists and if you uh -huh. check if you open up your participants tab. Oh, okay. Can you see it there? I see, I see it. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Yeah. Oh something went wrong here. I don't know what I've got there. Okay. Um So then, then the uh, nine votes passes. Yes. And yes. do we have to? Are there any other procedures that that I don't know about that we should? So you would re if I think for the next vote, let's be a little bit more clear. If you if you are going to take a vote from your community and you asked if they're in favor, then you would submit in writing to the county that you, that the CPO supports that um, particular okay. application. Okay. If they were to say neutral, if the, everyone were to say they were neutral on it, okay. you would not need to submit anything. If they are negative, uh, if, they're, if they are opposed to the project, okay. then you would submit in writing that the CPO opposes the project. And um, okay. you may want to provide some background information as to why. Okay. And clearly, you if you, any individual wants to submit something on their own against in that, you can you can do that as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. The the are we are we done with that one? Yes. Yes. So then the next uh, issue would be the. Um, the update on the uh, WUFC. 
Yeah, this Mitch. Uh, really, there's no real change since last time. Right now, um, we're still waiting for this the Luba appeal for the CUP to be scheduled by Luba, and the Luba appeal for the similar use interpretation is has been put on hold. That's by you know agreement with the attorneys. So right now we're we're waiting for the CUP um, Luba appeal date. That's really where we are at this point. Okay, and then the the CPO. Uh, summit update, and that would be Mitch. Was, uh, so, can I interrupt? We do have the Homesteader Lane one as well, folks. That you haven't, we haven't voted on. Should we vote on? Should we vote on that one? That one is not in the CPO or the Hamlet. That's that was my understanding. Um, is that the is that the home occupation for for events? Conditional, yeah, conditional to host events. So did you use the map for that then on the CPO map? It's definitely it's definitely not in our area. Okay, never mind That's then. Correct. Excuse me. Yes, it's on Napa Homesteader Road, which is in the far west CPO, okay. uh, just uh, opposite Wilkin Lane, if you're familiar with the area. I mean, if anyone has something that that is uh, significant negative on that, Maybe we would speak up, but I uh, I think if it's out of our area, then uh, if I'm not mistaken, Randy, that was already decided on, and and right now all we can do is watch the progress to make sure that they're compliant with what they said. Mm -hmm. All do. the conditional use was granted already. I, I believe that's true. Lynn was okay. shaking his head. True. So all we can do right now is to make sure they comply with what they you know. Get the parking area they said they would do and etc i mean okay so yeah. um and then the home occupation is a direct use is that correct in in the homesteader case it's a home occupation no, no i'm no the uh the chiropractic clinic because it's, it doesn't say conditional use on that no it's not it's a it's a special um section 822 um i don't know if they call it conditional use or not, but it's a special section they're applying for under the, the zoning ordinances. Right, right. Yeah. That's what I think. And yeah. then, um, uh, so the CPO summit is next, and that is Mitch. I'm not sure. I did. I did listen in. I didn't really uh, participate per se. Um, it, you know, there was a lot of discussion. Um, I'm not even sure I'm going to be able to summarize it very, very well, Randy. Um, there was a, a few handful of CPO organizations were there. Was it wasn't um, fully um, staffed, if you will. And that organization covers both, um, yeah, what they call it, um, rural and 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 some areas are unincorporated CPOs. So, so, so some some differences in, in what the coverage is from say the CPOs for um, just the rural areas. Um, and, and they discuss that in, in some detail. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I have to go back to my notes really, to, but I'm not sure, I'm, I can't remember who else attended if anyone from this, from this, from this meeting, yeah. Yeah, I think it's okay. Uh, uh, it's, it's a, you know, one of these Zoom meeting things and it's difficult to capture exactly what's going on, especially in the first one you've been to. Uh, so the Westland uh, School Project update, Len? I have not uh, heard anything on what's happening there. I'm not that familiar with it, so I can't speak to mm -hmm. it. I just, I just know that there's some construction underway. And then Katie. I'm happy to, to um, I can't officially update you, but I'm, I, I'm happy to do a quick summary. So Westland Wilsonville School Board, um, well, not the school board, excuse me, they came to us um, wanting to share um, the original master plan uh, for the construction on that site adjacent to Stafford Primary. And we did review it as a board um, and we gave them feedback, which they took um, to heart and came back to us with a revised master plan, which was significantly edited 
um, from the original. Um, and as I understand it, they've moved forward with construction of one single facilities building pushed back from um, Stafford Road, which is what we had requested um, because previously they had it pushed right up on the edge of Stafford um, and we weren't comfortable with the placement of that on the site. So we gave them that feedback. Anyway, it's under construction now. Um, and I think it, there's a possibility that they may phase in some of the other buildings in the future. Um, but I think that that was a very positive, um, a positive process in the way we all communicated um, with them and gave them feedback and it was reciprocated. So anyway, that's, that's my good. update. Yeah. Um, I hope we have some similar kind of experience on this, uh, on the other, the new projects that are coming up on Stafford. Um, so that leaves us, oops, that leaves us with the Rasik or Rasik uh, property. Um, and that, just a second here, I'm just kind of trying to get my, there we go. Um, the Rossick property is uh, at, at the uh, Rosemont turnaround uh, on the Stafford Rosemont uh, circle. And it's on the Northeast corner and it's, it's a city project that is going to be um, uh, turned into a, uh, a multi-use sports field. And the, uh, the city is, is going to have uh, three meetings that are sort of close to the public, but we're trying to figure out a way to communicate with them to allow the public to visit the meetings as we do here, because that would only be fair to the, to the public. And then um, uh, there are, uh, there are gonna be three of these meetings with representatives that are appointed and one meeting to the public, for the public. So the public can come in and make comments uh, at that point. And uh, the, uh, uh, the project is actually a, a fairly sizable, uh, fairly sizable area. Maybe Rick can uh, chime in and, and he knows, Rick knows how you know what the acreage of the lot is or the general size of the lot, but it's definitely a full size soccer field uh, uh, area. Plus, um, plus a couple, it, it, which will over, which uh, two baseball fields will overlay on top of this soccer field. There are going to be um, lighting, seating, covered areas, restrooms. Um, so it's going to be a full a parking lot. So it's going to be a full uh, athletic facility. And um, the uh, uh, I, I think it's 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 the it is definitely the parks and recreation. Uh, department that is uh, that is uh, sponsoring it, and uh, there also the the people in attendance were primarily um, uh, sports uh, associations, and there but there were a couple of neighborhood organ organization representatives, uh, including the Hamlet, which was me, and in attendance. And uh, primarily they, you know, the, a big part of the meeting was talking about uh, community agreements, meeting rules. 
and who is going to have input and who is not. And uh, uh, so they wanted to draw the lines in that respect clearly. And uh, at, at this point, they have no drawings. Uh, the landscape architect is on board for the, for the course of the project. And the project is scheduled. They'll be done in about a year to 10 months to a year. And the construction will be complete in December uh, 2022. And so this, this project is, is going ahead. Um, and um, the, the, uh, the, I think the, one of the things that um, they're, they, they have uh, uh, initial presentation, uh, they did a, a survey uh, to determine what kind of uh, what kind of amenities and what kind of facilities people were interested in in having and um, the one in this park and one of the uh, primary uh, one of the highest rankings was uh, natural areas also playgrounds and seating and shade, walking paths, uh, and shelter, and concession areas. And then uh, another element of the survey was who, who is most likely to use the park. And uh, the greatest number of people using the park would be for trails. Uh, organized sports were uh, also very, very high on the list. And um, one of the other uh, primary thoughts was what kind of uh, ideal design character should, should the park have? And by far the greatest number voted for a naturalistic. And then and then the other element is the travel to and from the park. And, uh, when you, and when you tend the park like this, how do you typically travel? And the greatest number drive alone. Uh, hey, Randy. Yeah. Uh, this is Rick. If I can just chime in real quick. I know we're getting sure. short on time. I don't want to make this go any longer, but um, I can throw a little packet to there and get it to the board. Um, I've got some slides that uh, I've talked with Evan about and, and talking about Pecan okay. Creek runs on the western edge of it. Um, and it's a, a habitat that we need to take care of. And they're yeah. conscious of it, but I don't think they're as conscious as we are about, you know, the animals that travel through there and live there and things like that. So I can throw a package together and then I'm going to suggest a letter from the Stafford Hamlet and CPO to the city and the board of saying, hey, yeah, we're willing to work with you. The traffic issues are going to be huge. The watershed, uh, wildlife piece is going to be big, the light, the noise, all the things that, you know, that yeah. sounds very familiar from down the way. And we can get that letter to them saying like, okay, here's what we would, we would be more supportive of the natural piece that fits into our new community vision plan for the area and that stuff. So I can throw that package together and get everybody and maybe a kind of a first draft of a letter um, and then we can send it to them. Um, it's, it's just under 10 acres um, and along with that, just up the road at the golf course is where the pool, the rec center is going in and all that other stuff. So this area yeah. is just going to get compounded and they, they're saying that the county needs to take care of the roundabout. Well, there's no funds to do that. So anyway, cram that stuff in a, in a packet and get it to the board and um, that way yeah. we can kind of move that along. Randy, there's a question from John McCabe and then a question from Patty. Okay, John. Yeah, the, the, I guess the thing I look at, especially when they said uh, December 2022 will be finished, the reason is, is they only have three years to use up the GO bond. 
and that's when it ends. Otherwise, they have to give the money back to the bondholders for not finishing it. So this is why they want to be fast track. But if I'm correct, this was what was supposed to be over on Lusher Field. They had all the planning, and then it couldn't go forward because of certain rules. And I'm like, that's that's their fault. And uh, I have to agree. There's a lot of um, areas that need to be uh, conserved in this area as wetlands and other, and for other animals. And I'm like. Uh, Lake Oswego just has to give the money back and start all over again. I, I don't think they're going to do that, John. And yeah, I, I, know, I know they're not going to do it, but <laughs> that, that's what we need to raise as an issue. This is being rushed too quickly. They're not solving the solution on the roundabout. Therefore, the, to me, this is just like WUSC. They have, they have to follow the rules and they're doing nothing about the roundabout. It's yeah. just gonna be a mess. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a problem, all right. So, uh, Patty? Sorry. Um, yeah. So it sounded like when you first started talking about this, Randy, that one of your concerns was that there really wasn't a place, uh, very much place for public comment that they're having closed meetings with representatives from neighborhoods? I mean, what's that all about? Yeah, uh, well, that's just the way their uh, system works, Lake Oswego. So that's why Rick uh, is talking about, Rick Cook is talking about, uh, we'll see the plan, develop the letter uh, and, and gives input from the Hamlet and the CPO on what, how we would see them uh, approaching this project that would make it a better project for the, the Hamlet, the CPO, the neighbors uh, all around. So, uh, but we have to see their plan first, you know, otherwise we're, they're gonna be, and that Rick, Rick has a comment. Yeah, just real quick, Patty. I I talked to the project I just have manager. One thing to say, if you if they're planning on having this finished by 2022, and you haven't even seen a plan yet, there's a problem. Yeah, there. The thing about the meetings is, and I've talked to Jenny um, Anderson, who's project manager, and I just wanted to sit in the meetings. Didn't want to do anything. I, I and she said, "Well, these are just for the." Uh, the PAC, the Public Advisory Committee. Public said, well, Advisory a, Committee. Yeah, I said there's a thing called public records in public law about meetings law. And she goes, well, I'll, I'll double check it. I don't think it's gonna be a big issue. I think we no. can put uh, the design needs to get done and then they'll throw that out. They're gonna have some open door or open house pieces um, as they move on. So um, it's going in, it's just a matter of how deep they're going to act, um, you know, with traffic and all those other things and try to get those things answered. Right. So I think that's, um, I think Rick summarized it really well. Uh, there, they, they have a, a public comments website and that may be how they are satisfying that uh, public, you know, access uh, portion, and that's uh, 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 Lake Oswego HTTPS. Uh, I'll send. The, I'll put that link on on that link. The, yeah, we'll send that link out, and you and can then, actually sit and watch the meetings too, if you yeah, have yeah. Nothing just, to do. But you can review the meetings, not when they're going on. I just put the links to both of those in um, the chat box. Mm -hmm. Randy, so, Mitch has his hand raised. Mitch. Just just want to comment. I mean, Rick, I feel for you. I mean, this is going to be a, just like the WFC proposal. This is going to be a year round, fully lighted, multiple sports, which means it's going to, it'll facilitate year round use. And the traffic is there. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the sounds like Lake Oswego is very much like Lake Oswego. They're not going to listen to anybody. Um, but, you know, we're going to loop about that. But, um, it's it's a 
it, it gets a, it's a bravo line. You just right adjacent to RRFF five land, right? I believe you still live there, right? And they're treating it like it's not because they own it, which I understand that they probably can do that. But, but you know, very frustrating how, how they you know can can make that decision. It's going to be a, you know it's it's going to be an ugly uh, situation. There. And of course, all the people sounds like they want some natural park. Well, that doesn't sound like they listen to that uh, input. Um, not done yeah. yet. Yeah. I think that I think the traffic issue right now the uh, circle is the the traffic circle is at a critical level as far as volume to capacity in their traffic study and this they're recommending that that traffic circle uh, get some turn lanes on it right away but there's no money anywhere uh, for that to happen at this point. So well, well, it's all at the engineering department and they're doing stuff. So I'll get that stuff out to you. And, and then um, as I see Bill going like, okay, we need to get out with the Hamlet meeting. So, okay. Um, good hey, work, Bill, right? We do have one more comment from the community. Do we have time to take that? Okay. One more question. Are you there? Maybe. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> sorry. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm Maureen Utes, and I'm actually in Lake Oswego. I'm your neighbor north of you on McVeigh. And I'm in the Neighborhood Association as an at large uh, officer now on uh, our Neighborhood Association. And we are just as concerned as you guys are, and we're trying to chase all these issues as well. <laughs> and I see a couple people laughing. Um, and we are trying to work with the Transportation Advisory Board and particularly with Will Farley to also clarify quite a few things. We are hearing um, these kind of conceptual things coming through that there is a McVeigh corridor type of concept somewhere down the road. We don't know what that means. We know that Parks and Rec did a traffic review, um, what, two years ago about um, the new pool and that whole complex upgrade. And um, that is kind of a moot traffic review at this point. And then we've been told by uh, engineering that they were waiting to do any further studies until traffic uh, leveled out a bit um, as COVID traffic changed. We're, I'm definitely seeing that on McVeigh. I live just off of McVeigh on Cornell. Mm -hmm. So um, their traf the traffic study for uh, the, the, the park center. Yes. Is yes. it's it's a new traffic study since because when? Since earlier in the year, like just, February or something. We just finished it um, last September. Um, I kept asking for it, and it, it's now at the engineering department. I have a copy of it. Really? Um, okay, you... because in tab, they they kept saying they were putting it off. Yeah, so well, in the it wasn't out for publication with the community yet. Um, I've been such a pain in the neck that I finally got a copy of it. So if you send me your email address, I can get that to you. Sure. So Rick, it's M-O-B-E-T-H-U-T-Z at gmail.com. And I'd okay. really like to be involved with you guys more too, because I think we all have the same interests in mind. And I, mean, I, I think so. With Mike and, and, and Jenny, so I'll get in touch with you. If you could just put that into the chat section so I can see it, and then I'll be sure I sure. have it right. Sure, sure. And, and I'll get to you tomorrow at some point in time. Yeah, and we're really also watching the new fields. Um, the whole Rosemont Circle thing is a joke. And, you know, they've been saying even uh, they probably will be expanding uh, parking in Lusher Farm because they're also going to be adding more and more, as we all know, which is fine. I'm not against that, but we're actually 
in, in so much uh, is coming into the same area. And, and we're also worried about um, the animals and wetlands and all that kind of thing too. So anyway, um, I just want you to know that I'm out here, I'm kind of newly put in some leadership roles. So I'm trying to sit in on many more meetings and uh, you know, process more information. And for me, the more the better. And I really want to collaborate as well as I know our neighborhood association does. We have- uh, you, And I will get a hold of you tomorrow. Okay. And we also have a new chair for our neighborhood association. Probably a lot of you know Jan Castle, and she kind of retired. So Ellen Steele is our new chair as of our uh, April 26 meeting. Just so you know, right. yeah. She well, th thanks. Thanks for sitting in on the on the meeting and and um, and and uh, introducing yourself. Uh, definitely, Rick will be hooking up and, yeah. and we'll be putting yeah. the package together. Uh, uh, well, we're going to need to we're going to need to move on because yeah, we'll sure. lose folks that um, that have to go to bed by nine o'clock, uh, <laughs> which is a lot of us geezers. Um, to that note, thanks, Randy, for uh, for okay. running us through and uh, and getting us um, through a, a, a fairly um, ambitious agenda. Uh, so. We're all ready here to call the uh, the Hamlet board meeting to order. And we've got an agenda. If you can throw that up, either Katie Kreider or Katie Wilson, one of the Katies, um, so that folks can see that um, and that we can uh, we can get a, a motion to approve it. Yeah, there you go. And then there's a few things on the next page. There we go. Excellent. Okay, so hopefully you've looked at this before this moment in time, but if you haven't, look at it now. Uh, if the agenda looks good, somebody make a motion. If it doesn't look good, make a, a change as you'd like, and uh, let's, we'll try to keep moving. Motion to approve. Thanks so much, Andy. Uh, second? Second. All right, thanks, Lynn. Okay, uh, and we're just going to delete discussion because I'm not feeling like there's a lot of that that needs to take place right now. Uh, all those in favor of the agenda as uh, as written? Bunch of hands up. Raise hand. There we go. Okay. Um, all those that don't want the agenda, <laughs> raise your hand. <laughs> okay. I'm going to assume Katie Wilson, that uh, that you looked at all that and that it passed with with some degree of uh, of support. Um, hopefully, you all got a chance to see Kate Ross minutes for both the community meeting and the and the board meeting. Um, can we uh, can we get a motion to approve those? Motion to approve. Thanks, Andy. Lynn, get ready, buddy. A second. Okay. I'll second. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of uh, approving the um, minutes, the draft minutes that uh, the Kate submitted, um, raise your raise your little mitt here on the on the machine. All right. Anybody that's opposed to the minutes or wants to make a change? Okay. Uh, Treasurer's report. Bill Long. Yeah, um, our interest for the um, trust account was uh, over three months, a uh, dollar fifty-five, something like that. Um, there is a thirty-eight dollar difference between my treasurer's report this month and last month. I just put it together too fast. The good news is that our um, checking book, our checkbook, matches the bank account. And you all got my report. Bill, you're, you're on muted, mute. Bill. But it goes so much faster when I'm on mute. Um, so the communications uh, committee, Patty, you want to, uh, you, I mean, there's some of the stuff that, that falls under that with Kelsey and, and Katie Kreider, but uh, you want to take that communications? 
pay manual. Crickets. Okay. I'm uh, here, I'm here, sorry. <laughs> I just took a small break. Um, you know, I don't really have that much to report. We haven't gotten together and um, I, uh, I think we probably need to. So I'll probably try to get us a meeting called, you know, within the next couple of weeks. But um, unless somebody on the committee has something to offer, I think I'm, I'm good to pass it on to Kelsey to talk about the Sunflower Project. Great, thanks. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Having some computer issues today. So yeah, uh, we did meet a couple of us briefly to work on our sunflower project. Uh, we had a bunch of seeds that we collected and we met and we packed just close to 300 packets of seeds that we're gonna be giving out pretty soon here. Uh, I've got one here, if you can see it, this is what it looks like. It just says Stafford Hamlet on it. And inside, there's a bunch of sunflower seeds. These will be free for people to pick up when we decide where we're gonna have them available. And inside, there's a packet. Well, there's a little thing here. This is a blown up version of it, so you can see it. But there will be a little card that will give instructions on planting, where to plant them, how deep to plant them. Um, and it has a little thing on it, a little blurb about why we're doing it. And basically what we're trying to do is just celebrate Stafford's character, um, the realness that we all love about it. And so we're inviting people to just take these seeds, plant them on your property, by the road, by your street, by your mailbox, in your gardens, by a fence, anywhere where the rest of the community can see them and enjoy them. Even if you're not inside the hamlet, we'd still love you to take part. Um, so yeah, and we got a lot of seeds ready to go and pretty shortly we'll have those available to people. So yeah, it's kind of where we're Great. at. Thanks a lot. Good, good job. Mm -hmm. uh, Rich? Rich Fiala. Uh, don't hear Rich chiming in, so we're going to move down to Andy Munson. Andy doesn't fall asleep in his chair. Andy oh. is ready to go. Um, give us hey, a Bill, it looks like Rich didn't know he was on mute. <laughs> you missed your chance, buddy. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Rich. I done? I'm done. Okay, nothing to report. <laughs> Uh, egg, egg, did you do anything with the egg department? Andy Munson's over there. He's dancing in, a, in place, ready to go on, on Earth Day cleanup. But you go ahead and take egg if you got something from the egg committee. No. Okay. Andy, take it and run. Uh, all right. We had a, a great Earth Day cleanup. Um, I would primarily say thank you to the one and only Bill Mart. And um, his son, John, we attacked Grapevine, picked up just a mountain of garbage. Um, Brandon Post, a former board member, happened to be on his way to work and jumped out of his car in his slacks and descended down the uh, hill and helped us pick a bunch of stuff up um, and get some really heavy stuff out. So it was a great effort. Um, it looks a lot better down there now. And I, I think that what we all got to be on is maintenance mode. And just, you know, you see some Coors Light can on the road, don't drive past it six times, like, you know, pull over and pick it up. Because I think if we maintain it, people will respect it. If, uh, if they see the garbage, they're going to be like, oh, okay, we can trash this place. Good job, Andy. Get, getting to the point and making a statement. Thanks a lot. Uh, and I think actually um, you sent some pictures to Katie Kreider and I think Katie Kreider forwarded those to Katie Wilson. So maybe in one of the, the county's publications um, and maybe on our website too, that you know something can be shown about what a nice pile of garbage um, is now at the, uh, at the transfer station in Oregon City, a uh, much better place for it. Uh, letter in opposition to House Bill 3087, um, Rich Fiala? It's actually 3072, but that's okay. It was so close. 
Yep. Um, uh, I sent it off to the rules committee. Great. And so then the next thing is me on, or is there any questions on that? Everybody, everybody said something, but there were no nays in it. So I took it as a go forward and I did. Great, thank you. The, lake, the next thing is Lake Oswego Westland Tualatin City Council work session update. Uh, those have been all presented and you've heard previously. Um, they are working internally to try and build momentum to uh, work on an amendment for the three-party IGA. And so uh, while we're a little slower as we built it towards a crescendo, uh, the cities are gonna take their time on it, but uh, none of them have said no. Uh, and so we anticipate that we will continue to interface with those guys and move this thing forward as best we can. Great. Good Any job. questions on that? Good enough. Thanks. Um, Rick Cook, you still awake, buddy? Been there, done that. Uh, Bill and I attended the North, uh, or North, the uh, Lake Oswego Palisades Neighborhood Association meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. They are really happy to get uh, back involved with us and paying more attention. They have a new chair. He's really good. And I've talked with him on and off. And he was meeting with Ivan Alder or Anderholm of the uh, Parks and Rec today. And I fed him some information to try to get um, presented there. So uh, Bill did a nice job laying out what we're doing, the new uh, CDP and all that stuff. So they're good to go with us. Yeah, no, we're, uh, we definitely feel like we're, there's, there, there's an advocate there and uh, they're just as concerned as we are about how our area is gonna you know, change if it's developed, they, they are too, is how it's gonna impact them. Um, so I've got a note here that the, the, you got till the 18th, I guess, to get your ballots in. It's the sheriff's, uh, Sheriff Levy, uh, uh, Clackamas ESD, uh, Westland Wilsonville School District um, election. And then I think there's also some folks there about from um, Clackamas Community College um, board. And so if you, if you haven't um, voted, do so. Um, it's, it was a fairly effective uh, write-up on each of these folks in the um, in the voters pamphlet. Um, so Reminder for you, Bill. The uh, today today was the last day to mail them in. So from now on, you have to drop them off at a drop-off box if you haven't got it. Thank you, Len. I didn't realize that. I mean, that's. That, that's a poor commentary that they don't think they can get something across town in seven days, but whatever. Okay, <laughs> good to know. Thanks, Len. Uh, Rick, uh, we got got you up here for uh, the uh, C4 and CCI. Hey, real quickly, um, uh, the C4 piece, which is the Clackamas County Coordinating Committee with the mayors and special districts and all that stuff at two commissioners um bottom line was the, the to me the most important thing was that they're uh they were going to select a, a urban cities uh member for the task force of the climate action uh, plan task force and uh pushed hard to get valerie pratt from twalton because there's no representation on that task force west of the Willamette River. Wilsonville has someone on, on it, but there's no representation for three of the largest um, you know, populated cities in the area. So pushed hard for that. They decided that they were gonna take a vote, do email stuff, so still haven't heard back, but hopefully Valerie um, Pratt from Twalton will represent that and working on our sequestration zone and helping along those pieces of that. So that was, that was really big there. Uh, CCI, um, I'll let Katie say that at the very end because she knows very succinctly that the only thing I, I do have to just very quickly touch on is I talked with John uh, Hangerton, uh, the guy that came out and talked about the uh, Stafford Road improvements. I just said, hey, we're meeting tonight. Could you tell us what's going on? And he said that they are still in the design phase. Um, They're going to have some virtual open houses probably in June. I'm not sure the date yet. They will send postcards out. 
Um, they are working for that meeting to be at 30% design. Um, there's a whole ton of constraints between the metro property, the slopes, and all those things. So um, they're, the plans, I'm not sure, are how fast they're going to come screaming through. But uh, so, and he would be more than willing to at some point in time come out and meet with us again once that's uh, all said and done. So that Great. was an update on that. Thanks a lot. Good job. Um, Katie Wilson, do you, do you want to say anything about CCI? Sure. Um, so CCI's main focus of, as of late is really focusing on supporting the in finding ways to solve the inactive areas in the un unincorporated Clackamas County where there are not active CPOs. So we're working on some different ideas for that, mainly outreach to find people who are willing to serve on boards in those areas, and then um, asking neighboring areas to help um, mentor those new members. So that's been a successful model. Um, and also exploring if there are areas that we are unable to do that. Are, is the, is the, are there ways that neighboring CPOs can help support review of land use applications? So we're continuing to look at options for that. Um, but I also, before we adjourn tonight, I want to let you all know that we are working on piloting a program for you guys to be able to host your own Zoom meetings using a county um, supported Zoom license. And so I um, want you to think about, I need a couple volunteers who are willing to train to do that. And, um, and then let me know who I should reach out to about that. Okay. <laughs> I'll take that under advisement. However, we feel like this works pretty darn well. And I'm just saying that if it ain't broke, um, but yeah, I get it. It does take staff time. Um, yeah, so I think the, the next thing up is we had a public and government affairs meeting. I don't know, was that, uh, I think that was Monday. That was yesterday. Whew, that was a long time ago. Um, and uh, we're going to do this quarterly. So Beaver Creek, uh, Hamlet Beaver Creek, ourselves, and uh, Molino, if they had chosen to be there, were invited. Um, but it was great because we got to have a back and forth with, um, with ultimately um, Katie's um, um, boss, um, boss of bosses, um, Sue Hildick. And uh, I think one of the things that stuck in my mind that uh, was not on my radar, but should have been, I knew about the $81 million that they applied for uh, from the feds for COVID relief um, and related things. They evidently have a, a good line on that, but they're not sure how they want to use it. And they're looking for feedback. So there's a, a survey that you can take. And I don't know if we, I, are we going to be able to put that on our website, that, a link so that they folks can come to us and take this survey? Because I, I think they're, they're very serious about wanting, you know, wanting some input about, and, and it, you know, it isn't just COVID. I mean, it can be COVID, but translate to you know, a big earthquake or an ice storm or a fire or any number of other things that um, that the money can be you know focused on. So, uh, Katie, can we do that? I did right. just go ahead and put the link in chat for those who want to access that, and then I can connect with you with the link um, for your web team to be able to Great. post that to the website. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, but the bottom line was, and Rick was there too, uh, it, it was, you know, it was a you know, very positive meeting. They, they didn't lose, I think she said they didn't lose any staff through all this. There were um, no position cuts and they've got some other funding sources that they're going to be able to add some folks in their specific department as well as other places in the county. Um, so uh, all in all, I think they feel like they, they weathered this about as good as you, as you could have hoped, um, you know, given the, the budgetary cuts that were already in place and then the additional COVID crisis. But um, anyway, it was a good meeting. So, um,
Um, that and the only other thing that I had was on June 16th, uh, instead of June 17th, I'm going to give a five minute update to the board of our county commissioners. It was supposed to be the 17th, but they had a conflict. Um, that's a, uh, that's uh, June. It's a holiday. Yeah, it's a holiday. Thank you. Um, so it's um, a morning, um, a morning meeting uh, for the board, and um, yeah, that's about it. And we'll actually have a board meeting before that. So if there's things that you folks want me to um, throw in there, don't hesitate. And obviously, I'll share that with the board, and I can share it with anybody else that's interested as well. That being said. Uh, is there anything from the uh, from the Greater Hamlet, um, either folks in the uh, in the audience or board members that would like to uh, throw anything out that has been missed? Raise your hand. Okay. No that's, hands. That's what I wanted to hear. I think that's what we all wanted to hear. Thanks for sticking it out, those of you that did, and uh, thanks for for coming and being attendants. Um, Good night, and we'll see you uh, see you June eighth.